It is, which I want. The second thing that we did was we managed to get hold of the um, temperature, we, the, the meteorological records. Uh, they, they send off balloons at the time of the Christmas Island tests, and you could, and, and you could from the data that I got, see the, the temperature at different altitudes. So you could see what was happening as the bomb exploded, the big, the big grapple Y bomb, which I'm talking about now. Now the grapple Y bomb. We also had photographs, which were, which I think actually were secret photographs, which I got, which I, I got in error, in fact, from the solicitors. And I think this may be one of the reasons they don't want me in court, because these photographs, which I should put on the internet, are sequential photographs of the bomb actually exploding, the grapple wire bomb. So you have a freeze frame, freeze frame, freeze frame, freeze frame of the bomb exploding. It was taken by one of the Canberra aircraft, which was uh, which was flying, or the Lancasters, which were, which were flying, and, and watching watching the whole process. And if you look at these particular sequential photographs of the bomb exploding, the grapple wire bomb, what you see is an enormous amount of seawater being sucked up into the plume. So there's an enormous. They drop the bomb from an aircraft. There's a, a Vulcan. There's an enormous bang. The pressure wave goes down and it hits the surface of the sea, it pushes it aside. And then the sea comes back again, hits in the middle and throws a load of water up into the, like a water spout, up into the bomb. Now of course the bomb, the temperature is enormously high and so the air is rising very rapidly and it sucks all this, this water from the sea up into the, into the stem of the bomb. And in fact we have eyewitness evidence from some of the veterans who, who are still alive who say that fish were falling out of the sky after the test, that, that it rained heavily and fish fell out of the sky. Well, of course, not only fish fell out of the sky, all the radionuclides from the bomb fell out of the sky with the fish. And the other thing that we got under the Freedom of Information Act was a letter from somebody from Aldermaston, from the Atomic Weapons Organization in Aldermaston, to somebody on Christmas Island saying, if, if it rains, they said, if it rains, what you have to do is you have to take all of your filters and all of your fallout collection devices out of the rain, because otherwise the sticky filters will get wet and they won't work. So you can see that if all of this fallout, fallout came down onto the ground and all of the sticky filters which were there to measure fallout were taken inside, of course, there would have been no fallout measured on the sticky filters. On the other hand, if the sticky filters were, felt, were left out in the rain, the rain would wash the fallout off the sticky filters. So either way, you're not going to get any radionuclides, any fallout in the sticky filters. So all of the records of the Ministry of Defence, which they've been using in this case, are complete nonsense. Right. Now the other thing we found out about that, that bomb, the grapple wire bomb, and something that the Ministry of Defence have been forever saying in all of their arguments, right back in the Rose and Black cases and so on, is that they only exploded the bomb when the wind was blowing out to sea. So it's Christmas Island, there's Christmas Island, you can see all this, I shall put it all on the internet. The wind was blowing slightly offshore, diagonally offshore, at the time that they dropped the grapple white bomb. This was the big megaton bomb, three megatons. Woomph. So the fallout, they said, the fallout would blow out to sea, safely out to sea, nobody, nobody can be hurt. But what, what they didn't say, and what you get from the balloon measurements, is that as you go up in height, the wind changes direction. So although the wind was blowing out to sea at the ground level, where the bomb exploded, at higher levels, above about 30,000 feet, the wind just changed around completely and started blowing the other, over the island, over the island. So my colleague Di Williams and I, we looked at uh, modelling the tracks of this plume, because if the plume goes right up to 50,000 feet, it goes up to the, to the, to the, to the tropopause. This is an enormous bomb. The idea of it going out to sea is, is, is really quite laughable, because Christmas Island is approximately 30 miles from north to south, and the, and the diameter of the mushroom cloud is, is more than 30 miles. So, it's, so it just goes bang produces this enormous mushroom cloud, which then drifts out to sea at the base, of course, but as it goes up, it drifts back over the island. And then it rains, of course, it rains out of this cloud, including fishes, which have been sucked up into the cloud, and all of the uranium, of course, because the bomb is made of uranium. The bomb is made of uranium. Tons and tons of uranium is the bomb. I mean, it has a plutonium core and so forth, but the bomb itself is uranium, because they have to reflect the neutrons into the centre. And there's another question about that, which also is interesting. Anyway, so, so up it goes, 
it gets caught in the jet stream, blows in the opposite direction over Christmas Island, and then it rains. The rain comes down, piddly 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 with this fish, and then the low level winds then blows it back over the island. So there was a lot of uranium on the island. And we also know that because actually, a long time after this, the, the, the New Zealand, a New Zealand team came and measured uh, radionuclides on the island, and they were looking for cesium mainly, and they found a bit of it. But what they also found was uranium. And they said, we found natural uranium on the island. Of course, it wasn't natural. There's no natural uranium on, 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 on a coral island. Well, not very much, anyway. They certainly found a lot of it. Okay, so that's the second point. The second point is that the measurements made by the Canberra bombers, you know, and the height, the temperature with height and so on, and the, the, the pictures showing the water being sucked up into the plume, showed that no, there was no question that there was a lot of radioactive rain that fell on those people. And that would have brought down alpha emissions which are not detected by film badges. So that's, that's, that's so there's one, now there's one more point too, what's this one? Oh yes, that's right, this is the final one. The aircraft that flew through the plume and collected the dust, this is the plume of the grapple Y, they actually showed that the amount of uranium in that, in, that, in that plume was enormously high. And in fact, if you back calculate from the data that I got under the Official Secrets Act, what you find is that the bomb contained about four, four tons or more of uranium. I mean, it's hard to believe, but it's possible that the bomb was just a big fat uranium bomb. And in fact, not long, quite some time ago, about 2004, I think, there was a, a program on the, on the radio under the series document you can look at these at the document series, it's on the Radio 4 website, and I was involved in that program. And what that program said is that the atomic weapons establishment didn't know how to make a bomb. So when they were making the atomic bombs at Christmas Island, it was mainly to impress the Americans so that they could get the American formula for making atomic bombs. What that program suggested from all of the documents which they discovered is that they hadn't a clue how to make an atomic bomb and that their fallback position was to make an enormous, an enormous fission bomb out of masses of uranium-235. And I wonder if maybe that's why I've been kept out of this case, because they don't want anyone to suggest the possibility that they never made an H-bomb, that actually it was the U-235 bomb, a very large fat one. And I have to say that they've taken that program off the, off the, the BBC record. So if you go back to the, the document series and you go to the archives for the document series on the, um, on the website of the BBC, you'll find that that program doesn't exist. It's disappeared. It's called H is for hoax bomb or something like that. Anyway, it's gone. They've taken it down. So maybe it was all a hoax and there was never an H bomb. There was just an enormous bomb made of... Uh... <laughs> oh, we'll ignore that, we'll ignore that, we'll ignore that. There was an, or an enormous bomb made of um, uranium. Right, so let's just finish this off now. I contacted Rosenbats and I contacted Hogan Lovells and I said that I didn't understand why it was that they weren't allowing me to be an expert witness. And they wrote back and they said, oh, well, we have problems with your credibility, this and that. And I wrote back and I said, well, how can you have problems with my credibility? I've won six cases in a row, you know, and my credibility is the same as it was then. So why is it that I'm not on the case? And then I contacted the individual test veterans, the, also the 16 test veterans. I wrote to them and I sent them letters. And I got a letter back from two of them and an email back from one of them. And they said they had no idea that I'd been taken off the case. Nobody had discussed it with them. Nobody has asked them whether I should be taken off the case. They had appointed me as their expert witness, and then I was taken off the case by some solicitors who hadn't bothered even to tell them. And for one of them, and this is really sad, Dawn Pritchard, who actually, whose case I, I, was, I was involved in long before they'd taken all of these and put them all in one bag, poor Dawn Pritchard died. She, she died during the... Uh, during this enormous period between the time I was going to take a case and the time it eventually came to court. She was dead. But here's the thing, Hogan Lovells didn't know this. She was still there on the list. So basically Hogan Lovells didn't, didn't know anything about the veterans. That Hogan Lovells had come in there as some sort of scam. This is my belief. Of course it may not be true. There may be some other perfectly reasonable explanation for this. 
But I find it hard to find any reasonable explanation that would keep out all of this evidence that I've been putting before you, and, and, and other evidence too, which I haven't got time to talk about, which, which are in all my reports. And the reason that I'm doing this, the reason I'm talking to you is this, that there are an awful lot of test veterans out there. There are an awful lot of people who were at these test sites and who were contaminated with material coming out of these bombs. And the material was coming down in the rain, and the material that, they sh that, that, was, that was destroying their genetic um, what, makeup, that, 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 that genomic identity, this material was mainly uranium. It was particulate uranium, uranium that they were inhaling, just as those people in Iraq were inhaling particulate uranium. And in that study that I did, in 2007 of the British nuclear test veteran children, we found a nine-fold excess in congenital malformations in the children, and we found an eight-fold excess in congenital malformations in the grandchildren. And now where is that? Where have we done that again? We found it also in Fallujah, also in Fallujah, another case of exposure to uranium. So it comes back again and again to uranium. And you test veterans have got to continue fighting your corner for this. And you cannot trust everybody anymore. You cannot trust these solicitors. These solicitors have too much to lose, and the government is too powerful and can bring too much pressure on them. So that's about it, really. And, I'm, and thank you very much for listening to this. I hope I haven't bored you too much, but I felt it necessary to set the record straight. Thank you.